Hello and welcome to Chapter 10, Legal Perspectives on Education. This chapter is, uh, for me, is more fun to talk about and it'll be more meaningful to you than some of the others. Let me take a look with you at what those will be. So here is our, our look and let me show you the objectives first. Um, explain the relationship between the U.S. Constitution and the responsibilities of the United States and uh, uh, public schools. Number two, key components of the rights and responsibilities of teachers as determined by courts. Three, teachers' rights and responsibilities, including appropriate and inappropriate teacher student use of social media. And that wasn't even in the last edition of this textbook. And four, distinguish between students' rights and responsibilities and at a citizen's and respite uh, as students. So uh, pretty short and sweet there. But this, this is what you're going to want to know. Um, this is what there's involved first, just legal aspects. And they do a pretty nice job of walking you through that. And then this is you, teachers' rights and responsibilities. And then here's the thing on social media, they hit really fast. But this here is, you'll carry more of this, students' rights in your care. Okay, so look at this long. And so to keep this from being a two-hour lecture, again, you're going to get to carry some of this and learn, do some of the teaching and learning yourself. So let's jump in here to uh, chapter 10. Here's a, another a good story, Education in the News, and it references this uh, back farther, but you take a quick read here. So you can imagine this is a story about a teacher that called her first grade students future criminals. And, of course, uh, she put that on Facebook, and that didn't go over so well. There was obviously some objection, and she lost her job over it. So that's, uh, that's a pretty important read there. So what are the legal aspects? Let me see if I can grow this a little. So legal aspects of education. Uh, critical component, becoming a teacher to develop basic family and legal perspectives. Um, teachers not only need to understand the law, relates to responsibilities, has readily apparent education news story. Uh, new things are emerging, like your appropriate use of social media by teachers and students. And we already have landmark cases. Uh, anytime you use the word landmark, this is free, it's not part of the chapter, landmark cases are ones that went clear to the Supreme Court or nearly that high, and all other future cases are based on it. That's called a landmark case. So in this world, of uh, talking about cases and law, I'll, uh, sometimes that word will fall in there from me of landmark. Uh, here's the blessing you have. You're going to get a whole course on uh, law, school law. I, I took a semester uh, of school law and a whole semester of uh, special education law, and you're going to get that whole thing boiled down into one chapter here. And let me tell you, going forward, some of you will get a master's degree in school administration and go on to be administrators. You, too, uh, will get a course in those things. And it's my hope that you enjoy it as much as I did because it really gave me some insight to why we did some of the things we do, as it will for you. Uh, increased technologies. Uh, I'll take you down here. The teacher, in many ways, is the implementer of the intersection between those who enact laws and those who administer laws and those who interpret them. And they give you a little diagram here. All right. And then I take you here. What are these things? Uh, these different types of laws. And a judicial. Uh, imperative process, a case law, administrative law, enabling law, and so that's what they are here. And I've started them for you, and you need to complete these sentences uh, here, 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 and this will be number one. And they come from here. Okay. So if you will, before you jump into that, let me just give you this. Um, 
enabling laws to those provide opportunity to make it possible for educators to do certain things. Uh, administrative law is made up of rules and regulations that the executive branches of the government create. Okay. And then uh, government has established a new statute of policy government office, such as Department of Ed, uh, develop rules, procedures to do this. And my wife was in uh, legislative uh, in, here in South Dakota for a number of years, some years back, and her contention was um, that this was more powerful than your ability to make law was the state departments that could interpret those law, develop rules, procedures, and this. And uh, as a legislator, you never knew where where this would go or if it would be challenged in court. Okay, and that's what she said here is those rules and procedures have the same force of law as an unelected body gets to interpret them. So once it's enacted into law, the rules, procedure are in place. Uh, if it comes under uh, question, then it goes to judicial process. Okay, judicial process is also used when it appears the law has been violated. The interpretation of state and federal laws uh, form a body of case law. And that's where you have here. So that here, trying to lay out the groundwork of where we're going. Okay. So the legal constitution, of course, they, they, these authors tiptoe around this. Uh, the U.S. Constitution, fundamental law of nation, uh, obviously. And when Congress develops a new statute, it must be in accordance with the Constitution. When a statute legislative develops a new law, it's of course the Constitution of states' constitutions. So three of the amendments to the U.S. Constitution are particularly significant in the government's education of public and private. Uh, the 10th, 1st, and 14th had profound impacts. Okay, here's the 10th. Grants responsibility for education to each state. Okay. And the first ensures freedom of speech, religion, and the press. And 14th Amendment ensures an equal educational opportunity for all. So here it takes you to the 10th. How we got there. The 10th is really kind of funny because uh, the 10th is... Uh, says anything that's not specifically mentioned in the Constitution is given to the states. Uh, see, let me read this. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by the states, or reserved for the states respectively, and the people. Okay, it does not specifically provide public education, so the 10th has been interpreted as granting this power to the states. Therefore, education in the United States is not nationalized yet. I predict within 10 years it will be nationalized, that schools will be governed and ran by the federal government, but it's not yet, as is many of other nations in the world, because that's right. Uh, many other nations they are. Uh, our founders knew that that would be a mistake, but I assure you we have come so close to this that it will not be a very big step to completely nationalize our public school system for education, either as a constitution or basic statutory law. This. Okay, it's first in the 14th here. So let me uh, go over here. So, fundamental law of the nation, and you will put this in number two here. And the Tenth Amendment applies state control of education. States make provisions for their constitutions. That's obviously. Okay, so here we get into church and state. So let's talk about that. Um, it's hard to get away from this. The nation has a strong religious heritage, and that heritage uh, was uh, Christian. And now, of course, we are backpedaling as fast as we can and turning and running where I am, uh, I saw on Twitter the other day people questioning how is the, the Christian faith about to go extinct? Which uh, obviously if you are a, a, a believer and, and, uh, and know anything of the, of the Bible, uh, that's predicted, is that's what will, uh, that that's uh, the talk of that will come. Uh, educational colonial times, education was primarily the religious matter and many of those who attended school were destined to be min and min the ministry. Put that right there for you. Uh, now, with school attendance open to everyone, 
there are serious questions about the place of religion and education. And in fact, we have, uh, especially the Christian religion, did everything we possibly can to extract it from our schools and our governments. Many private schools today are under religious sponsorship, but debate about the rightful role of uh, uh, rightful role of, of uh, religion in public education continues. Um, should public funds be used to support schools and religious schools? Can prayer be said at high school announcements and stuff like that? So lots of that. And then we have lots of court cases concerned with that separation of church and state. And remember, the law doesn't state separation. It says the state can't endorse nor prohibit the free practice of, but we forget that part often when we're interpreting and talking about separation, that the church, uh, the state can endorse, but it can't prohibit either. For example, state law requiring daily prayer to be read in classrooms throughout the state could be interpreted as depriving persons of liberty. Okay, and a state establishes religion, at least prohibiting the free exercise of it. States are not permitted to make laws to bridge the privilege of citizens. So then a court case is of about that. Now, public funds and religious education, here's a number of cases uh, about that. Uh, let me give you this one first from 47. I'm just going to read uh, what the rule, court ruled the reimbursement did not violate the First Amendment. Here's uh, Lemon versus Kurtz, and then go back to this here later. Court ruled the uh, legislation unconstitutional because the excessive entanglement between government and religion. Uh, and you can see they get a little more bold as they come farther. The big one, Zobrest. Uh, versus Catalina Foothill School District, court ruled the government programs that neutrally provide benefits to a broad class of citizens without reference to religion are not readily subject to establishment clause things. So let, uh, let me see what I have here. Uh, private schools today, religious debates over funding, prayer, curriculum, bond, uh, cases often involve first, 14th, and amendment classified as uh, public funds, uh, religion of public schools, the rights of parents provide education for their children, what that falls over. Okay. Oh, here's this entanglement. Then courts upheld separation clause of this. You apply the Lemon versus Kurtz case test. In the famous threefold Lemon test, the court uh, rubric emerged this. Does the act have a secular purpose in school? Does the primary effect either advance or inhibit religion? And does the act excessively entangle government and religion? In most cases, uh, addressing this public funds would meet this criteria. Okay. A useful rubric emerged, uh, Lemon versus Kurtz case dealt with attempt by a Rhode Islander legislature to provide 15% salary supplement to teachers who taught secular subjects in non-public schools. Okay, think about this. <coughs> to support those teachers, if they're not teaching the religion classes, they're teaching the, teaching the secular class, which read and write and arithmetic, you know, and uh, the public school wanted to support those teachers with 15% additional money to what they make. Because obviously, as we studied earlier, uh, the private schools pay less, pay less than public schools. Okay. And it goes on to say, uh, here are these things, and it was, they found that this was ex excessive entanglement here. Okay, what about transportation? Landmark case of the public provided transportation to students to schools. This ruled by the Supreme Court. The court held that in tax using, and that using tax raised funds to reimburse parents for bus fares expended to transport the children to church schools. A New Jersey school district did not, did not violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. And I benefited from this. I went to private school and got on the public school bus nearly every day of my life until the very last day I, I, until I graduated. Members of the uh, court viewed the Jersey statute permitting the bus transportation to parochial school benefits as public welfare legislation to help children who form school expensely. Uh, their own constitution has struck down enactments authorized expenditures. So this has been challenged again, but to my knowledge hasn't been overturned. 
but uh, not uncommon. And this was 47. I came along in the 60s and got on the bus. And I believe I was one of the first ones my age was back in the 60s. Got on the bus. And what was kind of cool is it wasn't just us. It was the kids from the public school, too. So we got to meet and know a bunch of kids from the other school. But here's that lemon test, uh, what that came down. And then the special situations. And you get this here. Um, and this will be your number three. You talk about the special situations here, right here. Um, this was wavered from a district application of lemon test. In the case here, uh, law created public schools to serve children with disabilities that were of Jewish descent and they had disabilities. So they wanted to create a school and they wanted the public tax dollars to pay for it but still be a Jewish school. How do you think that went? Well, it was a form of religious favoritism that violated that First Amendment because they thought it was excessive entanglement. Okay, and so you get to talk about that. And then this, Zobrest, uh, dealt with IDEA Act, and a student who are deaf are entitled to a sign language interpreter in regular class. Zopress uh, concluded that no establishment clause is violated because the kid was in private school, the child's in private school, they still could have an interpreter provided by the public school. And did you know this? It doesn't really hit this here, but uh, even, just because you're in private school, just say your children go to private school, they're still intended, they're, they're still entitled to a public uh, funding for special ed. And so one of the responsibilities I had in being a department head of a large department is we did all the assessments and providing services for any kids that were in the private school that needed special ed. And often, there wasn't a lot of them, but often uh, they at least wanted the assessment. And then we had some that, that came to our school for extra reading help, uh, remedial reading, math, stuff like that. And it was all paid for by us. And they were on our caseload, even though they attended their private school. So that's where this came from, Zobrest, 93, okay? And then the child benefit theory um, comes here. Uh, I, I, number four, you get to put what that is. It comes right out of there. And let me tell you what that, just use of public funds for secular services transportation, textbooks. I remember when I was in school, we got textbooks from public school for the secular classes. Benefit the child, uh, testing, diagnostic, therapeutic, remedial, uh, all is, hand, is dealt with. Okay, and so uh, that's just providing school services, still responsibility of the public school, uh, some pushback, then why don't the child attend uh, public school, but um, uh, that's uh, that's how it came down. So there's your child benefit theory, uh, Title One in, in religious schools, um, and again here's the case law about it, uh, creationism. Lots of lots of cases about that. Whether evolution or creationism, or, or creationism uh, cannot require schools to teach the biblical version of creation. Uh, so that was that come 87. So you can see it gets clear to the uh, Supreme Court about that. And that's, to me, the step towards federalism is uh, obviously it, uh, it doesn't look like we can make those decisions at the local level. So we take it to the highest court of the land and they decide what we can teach in our schools. Court of Appeal State Legislation authorizing a minute of silence. Uh, by teachers was unconstitutional. So, okay, that was the 85. You better not be having a moment's silence because it infer, fears, infers, and I animally disagree with this, that that is your endorsement of religion. Not a religion, just religion. So the courts, again, you can't decide. We have to ask the federal government what to do with that. All right, so uh, this one rejected the court appeals in the sixth that the readers did not burden the students' exercise of religious beliefs. But I'll let you look at it. Here's one on facilities, and it just gives you the case, uh, the ruling, and what it meant. I'm going to ask you to do these two for number five. And I'll show you where they are. Title one is this, but here, No Child Left Behind is right here. 
provide assistance to both public and private schools. Uh, ESA deals with assistance education. And then here is Title I religious schools. And here's a summary of those statements that this, uh, these two together. Laws and policies have the effect of establishing religion in schools, can be upheld by courts uh, to pay for secular textbooks, tax funds. So you, you look at this. You don't have to put these all over here, but that is what goes here. All right. religious activities in school as we looked at prayer in school let's uh, let's move ahead before we deal with that uh, schools can I impose majority religious views on all court ruled against teaching creationism and intelligent design so I let me just see if we can pick that out of here um, and again here look at all the court cases on that um, place in the center of what it means in the original design. I'm going to give this to you uh, and you uh, read through that and this is number is this six here. This is number six. When you pick through this and these court cases and make something about uh, this one and this one. Okay, and then we get this current debate of issues such as posting the Ten Commandments in classrooms and reading of the Bible in public schools. And so it's going to talk about that. Interesting about the Ten Commandments have been there for 200 and some years. Now we find that it's unconstitutional. Very interesting. Okay. Here's the prayer in school. Um, and I'm going to... Uh, Put that uh, here. Okay, and this will be your number seven. And here's what I want you to put about prayer in school. I want you to look this over here. Uh, read through this. Uh, have been continued to initiate school districts. Uh, this. Uh, let me see. Majority observed the district. Uh, okay. Pretend that we do not recognize that every imposing particular religious activity on the majority of all. So that's so here. Uh, tell me about these here. Uh, summary of statements: Church and state. Uh, you can teach the Bible as a religion course. Public schools is illegal to teach the Bible as part of a history of literature is legal. To miss children in public school once a week for religious instruction centers is legal. And I had a student teacher in a school that did that. Uh, reading the scripture and reciting prayers, religious exercise are in violation. Uh, that, uh, and it sounds crazy, but there was a time when that happened every day in our public schools. Can teach the scientific theory of evolution as theory, and state cannot require that the biblical version be taught. So you can you can teach one, you don't you can, uh, you don't have to teach the other. Uh, are made available to group. They must also be made to all groups the same type. So uh, there's a question on the test about that. That uh, you know you have a Bible study and the satanic group comes and wants to have a club. Well, uh, if they're available available to one group. They have to be available to whatever. And I, principal in the local school here, uh, told me he had that that the witchcraft group want, came and wanted uh, to have a club. And he's uh, he was uh, terrorized by that. He he had no legal right to say no. Now in a lot of pieces of place in the world that that wasn't concerning. Here in South Dakota, that's still very concerning that we'd have a witchcraft club in our public schools. But I don't know what came of it, but the day I was that happened to be there for something else, he, he had this uh, heavy look on his face and said, hey, what's going on? He said, well, I have to make a decision on this. So I don't know what happened. But here's the evolution design versus design here. Okay, so let's get into this. Segregation versus desegregation. Uh, legal social based on race, de jure is upheld by laws and government. You don't have to do all these. I got these for you. And then desegregation abolished racial segregations in '54, which was a, a, a colossal 
colossal uh, disaster trying to desegregate the schools. Uh, not, you, nobody admits that, but it just was absolutely a colossal uh, uh, thing. Uh, 54 courts and communities, uh, communities have made intense efforts to abolish racial segregation in schools. Uh, a major instrument of courts have been used to accomplish this was integration, often done by, here, here's why it was a colossal failure, busing. So when you say, whenever I hear the word busing, I don't think of taking kids to school. I think of hauling kids. So here's what happened, and this is all they say about it, uh, this integration, busing students to achieve a balance of students in terms of race, each school within the district. So uh, it has been used to manage school. The schools are the emphasis of particular curriculum areas in this. Hope has been that these schools will attract diverse schools. So what was happening that if in the big communities especially, you had one school was uh, heavily one race, another school that was heavily another race, you pick up uh, half of these kids, haul them two hours to that school, pick up half of those kids, haul them over here. So we had kids attending school two hours away from home, and what they found was it didn't, they didn't integrate at all. That uh, that was where the colossal thing was, is the expense and time, but the kids didn't integrate that... Uh, one of the things they never admitted was you can't force people to integrate. So it, it went away, but nobody ever said why. It was just ignored oh. after that. So magnet schools. Uh, they talk about magnet schools here. That another thing is these to attract uh, kids uh, based on these things that we talked about. Magnet schools, in particular curriculum areas, disciplines, themes. The hope was that these schools will attract a diverse set of students, and these efforts to integrate schools have had mixed success. Yeah, that's put it politely. No, they were colossal failures. Mixed success, yes. And now there's increasing concern over the re-segregation of schools based on where people live. Segregation or re-segregation caused by housing patterns and un non-legal factors is called de facto segregation. What does that look like? Here's what de facto segregation looks like that our inner city schools tend to be where the lowest income housing establishments are. And so it attracts large groups of families that are low income. So suddenly a school tends to be uh, uh, end up being a low income school where the, by far the majority of the students that attend are low income, which tends to include a lot of minority race folks. Still a lot of white people, as we said before, still there's more white people that are low income than there are the others combined. But uh, in the narrative that you want to explain, when you talk about low income, it can't be white people even though it is. Okay, And so what happened is even if there was people that weren't low income in these areas, when they started their families, they moved out to the suburbs, or you will in slang, the burbs, to put their kids in better schools and it became a de facto segregation nothing to do with law it's just the way it went and again uh, the brain power to be uh, don't know what to do because they tried busing already and so they talked about uh, other legislative things court things um, and so that's what they're saying is the magnet schools were uh, an attempt, are an attempt uh, to do that. Um, okay. Let me see how we're doing here. So integration uh, to achieve racial balance, uh, attract diverse students to the curriculum, like enriching good things. And, of course, you've got to be able to get those kids there. And now that we have this increasing concern over this resegregation that they're lining up differently, again, based on uh, what the school's like. So uh, let's see, we are on number seven, this is number eight, and you're going to get to do these all with number eight, and you're going to make a couple statements about each one. So before you do that, let's just look at them together. 54, my dad graduated high school in 54. Many states had laws either requiring or permitting racial segregation in public schools. And... Before you go crazy and light your hair on the fire over this, that was very common back then that you had uh, the black school and the white school. And uh, it was very accepted 
uh, and nobody thought much of it until the little brown a little uh, girl wanted to go to the neighborhood school. Okay, 54 lower courts are a doctrine of separate but equal. Okay, so they're separate, but they both are equal in lots of painstaking things, and as announced by the Supreme Court in Plessy, 1869. So that was based on 1869 is where that came from, separate but equal. Okay, that's what I'm saying. So before you go crazy, they had a, a court case in 1896. Uh, I'm saying the date wrong. 1896, Plessy, the court upheld Louis a law that required railway companies to provide separate but equal accommodations in black and white races. The court's reasoning at that time was the 14th Amendment implied political, not societal, equality. See, this is the thing with our race relations today is we don't look at history. We look at where we're at right now, and we go crazy. Okay? And people agreed with this. And for the most part at that time, after emancipation, these folks were happy. They had great facilities, but they were separate. Okay? Are you crazy yet? Okay, let's keep going then. And then we had this failure of it uh, in 54. Uh, the little girl, of, uh, I want to say Melissa Brown, I can't remember her first name, uh, versus the Board of Education in Topeka. And of course said the separate but equal at Akron has no place in education and the separate facilities inherently unequal. So in 55, the court rendered the second Brown requiring the principles of these first decisions to be carried out with deliberate speed. And so listen to this. 54, the time of Brown to 64, little progress was made, eliminated these segregated schools. Okay, 10 years. Uh, and 64, referring to the situation of this, there's entirely too much deliberation and not enough speed of Brown versus the Board of Education. The Civil Rights Act of 64 added legislative power to the 50 uh, pronouncement, and the act not only authorized the federal government to initiate court suits in the laggard uh, desegregating schools, but also denied federal funds to programs that discriminated by race. Subsequently, many efforts have been made to meet the expectations of court decisions. See, they promoted this in 60 plus years since Brown versus the board. There have been many efforts to school districts, communities for additional lawsuits. Uh, here they are. Plessy was the first one, then the Brown versus the board. Uh, here's another one, uh, Griffey, Griffin uh, versus County School Court instructed the local district court to require authorities to levy taxes to open and operate non-discriminatory schools. Uh, board versus Education said the courts, uh, this is 91, was to continue segregation. We've moved from the uh, fast of this. But here's the thing they don't say, that often when there was trouble, um, and again, this will drive you crazy, but they had to send in the National Guard that were armed to integrate the school. So can you imagine when this was going on, and there's been many movies made about this, that you would send the military to make sure uh, the schools would be integrated. Can you imagine the learning that went on at that time in those schools when the National Guard was there to make sure they were integrated? So, not sure that was the best policy, the best procedure. Obviously, integration was the right thing, but was that the process to do it? But again, the the, um, the authors here in the text don't talk about those horrible things. Uh, release from court orders. Okay, so you've got this uh, uh, here, failure of separate equal doctrine. Now the court orders uh, is this that uh, the courts lightened up on this. Um, what conditions must be placed for a school district to be released from federal supervision? That's right, that if you were deemed not integrating fast enough, the feds, federal government, you got on their watch list. Three cases offered instance of condition on which the courts could back away. Um, First, the Supreme Court that it clear that federal supervision of, uh, tended to be temporary. Second, the court stated that the relations of desegregation uh, took on student assignments, but in every facet of operations. So this is uh, this. Um, 
court stated that in relation to desegregation, the district should look not only at student assess assignments, meaning where they were, but every facet of school operation, like faculty, staff, transportation, extracurricular activities. So you have to integrate all of these. Integrate faculty, integrate staff, transportation, all that. And third, for the first time, courts defined what full compliance uh, this would mean. So the feds, again, are going to tell you how to run your school, and we were okay with that. It has been seen in today's diverse schools in the classroom, and I'm not sure that's true. I think it people integrated themselves that uh, people chose to go to more diverse schools, uh, not because what the federal government did, but this these authors love this, so we're going to agree with them here. Okay, integrating uh, here, President, 500 school districts experienced some form of federal oversight uh, address segregation. At present, 500. Instead of schools and communities becoming integrated, this. So um, that's what you get to talk about there. And there's race conscious assignment there. Okay, so let's talk about equal opportunities. Oh, well, here's these cases. You don't have to, but you, uh, several of these are on the test. You have to know Brown. Here's the thing with Brown. Brown also was the landmark case for 94-142. 94-142. So we just went through this of separate is not equal. It was here. Separate affiliates are inherently unequal, and that's what they applied to special ed that you can't have separate facilities for kids with disabilities. And that became the movement uh, of uh, that. And so I'm going to give you that right here. You get to put one in here right in the middle of these. Um, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting what number nine is uh, 94142. Uh, you tell me what year and what 94 and 142 stand for. What do those terms stand for? So here's number nine, right in the middle of court cases, right here. You tell me what year 94 142 passed, and what does 94 stand for, and what does 142 stand for? But Brown versus Board of Education was the basis of 94 142. Okay, so equal opportunity. Here is uh, discrimination. Uh, these um, things here. And so let's uh, let's look at that. You're going to get all this here. This is number ten, um, and I'm going to mark these for you. Here's number ten. And again, don't do these till I talk about them, and then I'll ask you: Is English only? Um, this affirmative action is this here a reverse discrimination? Okay, let me talk about those. Then you come back and do number ten. Uh, denied a constitutional rights by individual or group. Okay, so. We, we lose this sometimes, but discrimination is this, that you, whatever your constitutional right is, it's because you are a particular, uh, of an individual or a group, you're denied that. Okay. Uh, court case of federal is directed toward preventing discrimination in schools, can be defined as that. Uh, for example, African Americans, women, people with disabilities have been denied constitutional rights and common uses of the term applies to various minorities or individual members' minority work uh, rights. And, and again, what they don't mention is that it also can be applied to white people. I know that's uh, many uh, white people also are denied their constitutional rights for whatever reason, but um, that women are mentioned, but uh, uh, this is a really poor example when you limit it to that. Okay. And then here's Title uh, Seven. That Seven states this. And Title IX in 72, and you've heard of this one before, basic, nobody can be denied on the base of sex. And this should be gender, because this is very politically incorrect to say sex. So when you put it in there, you say on gender. And now we're, especially both of those words really went haywire, because now we have transgender. And so political correctness would prevent you from doing either. Since I don't know what to have you put there, you put the word gender knowing it's already incorrect because of we have now people that are neither gender. And so you will get to deal with that in your school, and good luck with that. Uh, 
So I can't, because of gender, can't be excluded in participation or deny the benefits or subject of discrimination under any uh, education program activity. And this really was not even about sports. This law and or this uh, enactment amendment in 72 was about math and science and STEM, and it ended up personifying itself almost exclusively as sports. And it caused all kinds of problems because uh, our small community suddenly had to offer girls only sports. And what this really becomes uh, got all mixed up and just a big mess was what about the little boy that wants to play volleyball on the girls' team? Ah, uh -huh. separate is equal. Should he have to play on the boys' team? What if we don't have a boys' team for volleyball? And the other way, we have lots of uh, examples of the girl football player, the girl wrestler. Uh, th those issues all became entanglements because of nine, Title Nine, and some of which you'll get to deal with. And some of you maybe played on a different gender team. Uh, great, great, and lots of examples of girls that helped football teams or uh, wrestling teams. But now, again, what's going to really uh, give you fits is the transgender folk uh, that are neither gender that can select whatever team they want to play on. Here's bilingual, uh, English only. That is here. You get to deal with those. And um, affirmative action uh, here. And let's. Here, this is the affirmative uh reverse discrimination in which a majority of an individual or majority is denied certain rights because of preferential treatment provided to a minority or individual of minority. So what has happened, where reverse is, uh, for example, some college has gotten in trouble with this where they uh, have really strict criteria and then somebody that's more qualified is denied because they weren't the right um, uh, uh, background, weren't the right race. And so they reverse discrimination. Even the courts upheld some of the college's rights to do that, to deny uh, people their constitutional right uh, because they had met, or, or, you know, had had better qualifications. Uh, this so so here's the history of affirmative action, and it, it created a lot of problems also. But you're never allowed to say that. But it was uh, Roosevelt did it first, exact for prohibiting discrimination on government contractors. Uh, that again, okay. and so what happened was we no longer looked at other criteria strictly at race. Kennedy makes the first reference to affirmative action in order to mandating the federal contractors. Uh, here, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act. Johnson outlined specific steps for federal contractors. So again, you, don't get me wrong. This is absolutely should. Uh, everybody should be allowed to uh, do this. And if you're selecting contractors based on whether they're white or black instead of what the quality of their work and their bid on the project is, well, then you deserve what you get. If you get subpar projects, that's what you get from federal government getting involved. Johnson uh, outlined specific steps for contractors to ensure hiring equality. So now they had to hire equity too in the same way. Now do you get the best workers or do you have to have this racial balance? And the court said, and President Johnson said, you got, that's more important. The best workers, the racial balance is more important. So on and on here. Here's the latest one in 03. Uh, rules that race can be considered by colleges in their efforts to have a diverse student population. So we have the strict criteria, and even though uh, one uh, person has a higher thing, if he doesn't allow us to have the minority mix we want, that's more important. So that, my folks, friends, is reverse discrimination, and it happens all the time. It happened to me. Well, of course it happened to me, and here's what happened to me. I applied several times for a position as principals or assistant principals in buildings, and uh, the district wanted gender balance. So they wouldn't say that. I'd applied to through, jump through all the hoops, wouldn't even be not granted a, uh, an interview because I was the wrong gender. We all knew that. We knew it had to be a woman because the one they were replacing was a woman, but they wouldn't say that. They just would not. I never got granted it twice that happened. I never got an interview because I was the wrong gender, even though no place ever did it say that. And, oh, I forgot to say, I had a Ph.D., a doctorate degree in school administration, and both times the people they held, hired only had a master's degree. 
Now, I, I'm just saying that's what reverse discrimination looks like. So, uh, okay, so you got this. Uh, concerns about reverse discrimination, you talk about that, and that's all number 10. I'm not going to hit this real hard because you have some other background in this, and we talked about this already. Uh, what about opportunities for disabilities? And again, like I said, it came from a uh, little girl, Brown versus the Board of Education. And here's the Rehabilitation Act. Let me just walk like this. Uh, the Civil Rights Act, and then 504 uh, is a federal statute, focus of equal, not same treatment. Uh, again, and they have very specifically because you have to well, let me show you 504. Uh, equal treatment, as in other civil rights contexts, must be addressed. However, this does not necessarily mean same. For example, giving the same assessment procedure to students with disabilities and other students may not be equal. E educational judgments in relation to students with disabilities require heightened standard. The measured must lift the student's circumstances. Procedural safeguards must be employed. Appropriate uh, education means that school system and related parties must address the individual needs with disabilities. Okay. Uh, has a. Okay. So here's 94 142 Education of All Handicapped Children Act. And there's a FAPE. And you put this FAPE in here. You put this acronym in like this, and you say FAPE because. Uh, that's one of the acronyms we'll throw around in education and FAPE meaning free appropriate public education okay and then you get this this will be your number 11 is what is an IEP and what is it about and that will come from right here here's IEP and talk about this in your statement Increased rigor response to intervention. Okay, right here. Just for that one, that comes from here also. And so this is number uh, uh, 12 here. What is response to intervention? Now you! Teachers' rights! Yay! Yay! So let's look at it. Due process protection. Teachers have the same rights as other citizens. However, as teachers, there are some limits to those rights. The 14th Amendment gives every citizen the right to due process. Both substantive due process and procedural due process. And so you will get to talk about those. <laughs> I guess that's late. That's clear over here. Okay. Let's look. Uh, due process protection. Okay, so you will get this one. This will be number 13. What is due process protection? And there it is. Uh, so you have these same rights of contracts, the provision that they also assume heavily responsibility in educating young people. This, okay, and here's a whole bunch of case laws that we got there. Here's ones on discrimination from 82. Court ruled that school employees as well as students are protected under Title IX. Okay, in other words, you couldn't discriminate based on gender, and I was discriminated against. I just didn't, uh, you know, anytime you uh, you see this word, court ruled, meaning a court case, meaning somebody spent a ton of money to make that happen. And that's what schools have gotten so gun-shy. It costs so much to defend themselves that you see way less cases now because schools fold so quickly. They collapse, give in to horrible things because they don't want this term because that means their school spent a lot of money. So a superintendent... When I was in grad school, uh, that's what our old professor would say. You don't. Your job as superintendent is to make sure your school is not in court, and that was code for you'll agree to just stupid things 
so that you don't have to go to court and spend your school's money. Okay, so here's another one. 74, court struck down the board policy forcing all pregnant teachers to take mandatory maternity leave. Okay, here's another one from 81. Court ruled that policy violated Equal Pay Act, Title VII, and the Civil Rights Act, paying female coaches half the salary of males. Okay, so you see some of this made sense. And the thing I would say to you is I can't believe this had to go to court to make that happen. Uh, here's one, contract rights, uh, bargaining, uh, academic freedom, one, uh, which you don't have. Uh, Pickering from 68, court of appellate teachers claimed that his first and fourth row were denied. And here's why the teacher dismissal of an Illinois teacher for criticizing a school board and superintendent in a letter published by the local newspaper. And they that's never good policy, to criticize your employer. And yet it's a common thing that teachers don't are upset with their superintendent or board or both and take shots. And now we have social media. You can have all kinds of pundits, uh, your families, different people can take shots and stuff like that. But now this, what happened here in 68 now is in social media where you can lose your job because of that in social media. All right. So first of all, conditions of employment. Uh, can I just say this so that you can, uh, you're going to uh, get all these also, and this is number 14. And again, you can start on this or just wait a second till I talk about them, please. Conditions of employment, uh, specific criteria such as certification that must be met in order to be hired. Uh, here's certification of licensure. Purpose of this is the process by which state determines requirements and that's what we'll do for you and then you'll take your credential from us and you will go get your state license uh, from the state to practice the profession. It's not a right. Uh, teacher certification, however, is properly property interest and cannot be revoked without constitutional due process. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you now, but someday if you're ever threatened to lose, be losing your license, you'll want to know that. So here, usually boards of education have the statutory authority to employ teachers. There's a question on the test. Who employs you? And it's not the superintendent, principal, it's this school board, the Board of Education. These other folks that says here, uh, authority includes the power to enter into contracts to fix terms of employment and compensation. In some states, only specific members of the board. When statutes confer the employing authority of the boards, the authority cannot be delegated. Okay. They do it in the official board meetings. Uh, here, this is on the test too, a typical teacher contract. This is what's stated in the teacher contract. Obtain these elements, identification of the teacher and the Board of Education, uh, identification, identification, a statement of legal capacity to, of each party to enter the contract, a definition of the assignment specified, as what, what grade, what you're going to teach exactly, a statement of the salary and how it's to be paid. And what that means is a salary, here I'm going to pay you uh, uh, starting salary of fifty thousand dollars, and we're going to pay you one twelfth of that each month, and a provision for signature by the teacher and by the legally authorized contract is not official until it has been signed by all parties. Okay, and then teachers are responsible for making certain they are legally qualified to enter in the agreements. For example, a teacher may not enter into a contract without having a valid certificate. Now, there's a little wiggle room there. Uh, one is, uh, especially once you have a certificate and you're waiting to renew, a lot of uh, states will allow a two-year probationary period, a two-year um, authority to act, we call it, that you could teach two years, but then you have to have, have it. I'll give you an example. I had a student one time that was an elementary special ed major, and a school really needed somebody to teach their science. So she took the job as the science teacher in the middle school and high school, and after two years, uh, she wasn't certified, but she left and took a job in another district as a, a, a special ed teacher. And that district found a science teacher at that point. But she taught for two years. Even though she was a licensed teacher, she didn't have a credential in that thing. So she, she could do it for two years. Uh, so here, uh, and as far as this, uh, your, your contract, it doesn't state anything more than that. I think the question on the test says, can they uh, tell you what your dress code has to be? And that's not part of that. 
So here's tenure, um, a system of school employment which educators in their positions indefinitely unless they are dismissed for legally specified reasons through clearly established procedures. Um, so how do you become tenured? Uh, are automatically uh, becoming teacher are not automatically tenured. A teacher becomes tenured by serving satisfactory over stated time. And generally that's set up by the state this period for, is referred to as a probationary period, and it's typically one to three years. Some states, in one year, you're tenured, uh, tenured. Some, it's three. I think in South Dakota, it's three. The actual process of acquiring tenure serving a probationary period depends on the applicable statute. The process is automatic at the satisfactory completion, as it is in South Dakota. If you are offered your contract for your fourth year, you're automatically tenured. Okay. And what does that mean? It's... Uh, now they have to have due process to to not offer you another contract. Okay. Some states, agencies, federal are are beginning to advocate a more specific criteria, including evaluation to extension which teacher use data, peer reviewed things to make it a little harder, uh, and then dismissal uh, of tenured teachers. Uh, well, you know, at the end of the term, we watched uh, Waiting for Superman. And you saw how hard it is to dismiss tenured teacher. Uh, lots of lots of cases over this uh, position after she was arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol. Uh, Turk's appeal was upheld by the lower court because there was no evidence of an adverse effect of her cap capacity and fitness as a teacher just because she's driving under the influence. And the board appealed in Tennessee, which rejected the school board's uh, finding. Uh, acted in flagrant disregard of the statutory requirement and fundamental fairness in considering matters that would have specifically charged in writing. Okay. Dismiss uh, the charges be made uh, in writing specifically. Nevertheless, teacher tenure may be affected by teacher conduct outside of school as well as inside. And this got a lot more slippery than it used to be. Uh, one of the things when I studied school law and I was in grad school, many, 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 many cases about this particular thing. What what would be deemed conduct that would get you, that you could be lose your tenure that you could be fired? Like for one of the things was having an affair, uh, you know, with someone else, a spouse in the school. There was a time it was. Now I assure you, it wouldn't be that our moral turpitude has changed so much so far now that um, I witnessed this uh, more than once. And I remember one time what happened was. Uh, the two both taught in the same school and were having an affair, and of course they both lost, lost their families over it, but the district didn't fire them. They didn't want this uh, court-ruled thing, so they moved them both out of the building to other schools in the district, and they never got together. <laughs> But they both lost their families out of it. But they, and in my opinion, because I'm old and crabby now, they should have been fired, but they weren't because they didn't want no court case out of it. But it's that kind of thing, and it's changing. But um, a quicker way uh, to uh, lose your job is to not not do your job properly. But don't, you know, and we've said several times, we're held to a different standard. Uh, your behavior as a teacher is held to a different standard than a lot of other professions. So don't embarrass yourself by having to um, deal with this. We had a, a, a lady here in Sioux Falls a few years back. Her son was uh, selling drugs and running drugs out of the basement of their house. And she uh, taught in the district and she was let go. I think she could have challenged. She was tenured. Her claim was she didn't know. And yet the witnesses, uh, you know, that when the arrest was made, uh, the, the neighbor said there was constantly people coming at all hours of the night uh, making up, you know, doing the business and stuff. And she, she and her husband claimed he was, he, he uh, I forget what his deal was, but he got in some trouble too. Uh, this is interesting. There are shots here uh, about, uh, you know, tenure laws frequently attacked who claim that laws protecting competent teachers. And again, that's what uh, 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 Waiting for Superman was about is how hard it is to get uh, to ask teachers off that, uh, that aren't effective anymore. What about the rights of non-tenured teachers? Uh, featuring this, you still get due process. 
I think, let me see here. Although due process has been applicable for years, tenure teachers, non-tenure teachers do not, for the most part, enjoy those rights. Example, I'll reread the education news. That was where the Facebook person featured at the end of the chapter. At the end, the judge ruled that non-tenure teachers should be fired for her actions. So if you're not tenured, uh, you certainly don't want to post stuff on the Facebook criticizing or doing something. Um, and dismissal here, it gives a court case. Um, and so what I saw, too, and I witnessed this, too, is that uh, there's somebody that's struggling in those first couple of years. I saw a principal uh, give, I thought, ex uh, exaggerated poor reviews because he didn't want to have to uh, go through a process of uh, trying to, to get rid of her. So his, his plan was to uh, not renew her before she had tenure. I don't know what's right. She seemed fine to me. I thought she did a nice job, but he decided she wasn't. So uh, he, he wrote some, I thought, particular harsh reviews that I, I was, she shared those with me. And uh, she was blessed. She got out of the, <coughs> she took another job in the district out of our building. Okay. So that's non-tenured. Um, and then the statement of teachers' rights and responsibilities. Please read this. Okay. And then um, collective bargaining, you get to write about that here uh, and address this in several here, here, and here. Uh, interesting, they, uh, again, these authors really take some weird shots at groups and peoples here. Uh, You're right, I don't like these authors. I think they're very biased. And then academic freedom. Uh, we give you a whole thing on academic freedom here. A limited academic freedom must be professionally responsible. Cannot just read decisions on textbooks. Lots of things happen on textbooks. Uh, have more freedom to provide supplemental methods and teachers freedom limited with effectiveness jeopardized. So uh, you you can have your freedom, but it better not jeopardize your ability to teach and or be disruptive. And so uh, I'm going to say to you, for the most part, uh, you have limited uh, or no academic freedom. Uh, dealt with academic freedoms, uh, public school event. Pickering was a teacher in Illinois who, in a letter published in a local newspaper, criticized the school board and superintendent for the way they handled a uh, past proposal to raise and use new revenues of school. After full hearing, the board of education terminated his employment, whereupon he brought suit, Fourth Amendment. Uh, Illinois court rejected his claim. The U.S. Supreme Court, however, helped held their cl uh, Pickering's claim and uh, said that he shouldn't have been fired. It's difficult to define pricing the limits of academic freedom in general. Courts strongly support, yet recognize that teachers must be professionally responsible inter interacting with pupils. In most instances, here it's highlighted, teachers are, are not free to disregard the school board's decision about which textbook to use, but they're able to participate in other things and choice and things like that. So here's uh, uh, back to uh, fair use. Thing there, uh, book banning and censorship. Um, this is interesting on grading. Uh, FERPA, I gave you FERPA here, that's clear up here, is maintain confidential student records. Students, parents have the right to view the student records, all student records. <laughs> Don't make a mistake, there's teachers' written comments must be shown to students and parents upon request. What does that mean? So you're keeping some little side notes over here in this one folder that is still uh, bound by FERPA, and there's been court cases over that. This is interesting, a peer review assignment allowed under the law, and teachers might be found liable for negligence or malpractice through this. So here, let's look at this. Uh, here's FERPA. Schools must do this. Okay, and please read this. I don't have stuff for you to put in here, but... Please read that, all that about PERPA. But this is interesting about grading. Common instructional practice to have students grade one another's work. And you and I have both done this. Uh, I think it's less now, but in my day, it was almost everything. It's common practice that resulted in a suit that went all the way to the Supreme Court. So, okay, again, if something went to the Supreme Court, 
somebody spent a lot of money to get it that far. Okay, so this was the one, uh, the plaintiff alleged violation PERPA. So they, it was found that, uh, uh, that they didn't. The plaintiff alleged violations of FERPA in regard to peer review. The suit was funded by the Rutherford Institute, see? So the family didn't have to. At the Rutherford uh, thing, here's a shot by these authors, these biased authors. In the Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit Court within Oklahoma parent that students should not grade other students' work. And in 2002, the Supreme Court was unanimous and overturning Circuit Court and said that privacy laws was directed at records kept in a filing cabinet and records room with permanent things, not grades on a classroom paper. Okay, so the interpretation was because of FERPA, you uh, grading your neighbor's paper would be violating FERPA. And the lower courts uh, said, yes, that's true. Uh, you shouldn't. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 no. They didn't say you should do this. They said it didn't violate FERPA. So I'm saying to you, I don't know if you want to do this or not do this. Uh, the Supreme Court said in 2002 in OASA Independent School District versus Falo, Favo, Favo, that it didn't violate FERPA. There. So you got to know what it was. So not saying do it, saying it doesn't violate FERPA. So, teachers' responsibilities, uh, here, uh, this, so tort and liability, I think, let's see, here is an act that violates private rights of an individual and negligence is failure to exercise or practice due care. Okay, and so, um, students enrolled in our elementary school is almost inevitable, some will be injured in educational activities. Each year, some injuries, occasions, lawsuits, and the plaintiffs seek damages, uh, often brought against uh, both the school district and their employees. Legal actions seeking monetary damages for injuries are referred to tort. Okay. Uh, so this is not only in schools, but in all cases of law, an act or omission of an act that violates private rights for an individual, and especially if it was intentional. But nonetheless, a tort. So this is uh, one of the things we laugh at here. Like, uh, my son's going on a field trip. I have to sign a thing that says the school's not liable. Well, if the school commits a tort, uh, they are still liable regardless of what I've signed. And the courts have sided with that over and over. Uh, you're going to play in this fun place, and you have to sign that they can't be sued. Well, they can't unless that place commits a tort. Okay, Then they can be. Uh, understanding the concept of negligence is essential in understanding liability of liability is the responsibility of, for negligence. Okay, and so uh, failure to exercise or practice due care. So you don't want to be negligent as a teacher because you have this, the, the, have the right to duty to protect, and you're going to put that in here. This is about number 15. right here and please protect my children because that is one of your substantial duties as a teacher that look that's okay with me if they right walk on those things they learn their balance so what is education malpractice uh, is a, a culpable negligence neglect by the teacher uh, Sample of a case described next. Okay, so this negligent chemistry teacher, uh, California teacher chemistry class pupils were injured while experimenting with the manufacture of gum powder. Uh, the teacher was in the room uh, and had supplemented the laboratory manual instruction in his own directions. Nevertheless, an explosion occurred allegedly caused by the failure of pupils to follow directions. A court held the teacher and the Board of Education were liable. Negligence in this case meant that the lack of supervision of laboratory work, potentially dangerous activity requiring a high level of due care. So if you're fiddling around with, um, with explosive stuff and you have to anticipate 
that students could happen and it's been cases about kids getting cut with glass and stuff but anytime you should have used more care than you did and then here you can read this one on field trip uh, here chemistry field trip and liability insurance here I'm gonna let you do those and that's gonna be number 16 Um, social media for monitoring your email. So let's read about that a little bit. Ever increasing variety of forms and use of technology, promising practice, teaching and learning, also a potential source of problems. So emailing to the most ambiguous forms technology used in schools is email and texting. Email seems to have become the basic form of communication between administrator and teachers. And nobody I mean that 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 we didn't need to write that because that's all new. Uh, let me give you a little history. Um, Twenty years ago, uh, when I was still teaching in middle school, I was there at the genesis at the beginning of email, and not everybody had them. The administrators all have them, and I was the department head of a large department, so I got to have email, but I was only allowed to use it certain times, and it was really clumsy and didn't always work. But it was at the time it was so cool. I could send something and of course it was prior to anybody having it on their phones or anything so uh, we lived through this and you saw some of this but now this is one away I haven't checked my email uh, now unfortunately uh, we most of us get them on our phones I get my gmails and all my campus email on my phone along with about it seems like hundreds of other uh, notifications for different stupid stuff so it's instant. It almost came on the, the uh, like messaging, instant messaging. Now that email is almost as instant as texting. But uh, I lived through that. Like for example, my immediate supervisor in the central office was out of her office a lot, so she often didn't see email to the end of the day. She didn't check her email, and it went a long time. It went quite a few years before we could check them at home. And of course, now I have the exact same email on. Uh, my home office as I have on campus and every place else. So uh, there's my shtick about that. Uh, texting is a basic form of communication between teachers and other teachers and students with other students. Teachers may use email and texting to communicate with students and parents. Problems can arise by hitting the send key before the message is carefully composed or sending message to all instead of only the one you apply. This mistake can create embarrassing moments but some can be more serious consequences. So uh, you may wonder if it's legal for a school district to monitor emails. If a teacher or with a college where you are studying uh, teacher ed to read e your emails. If you use the college or school district's email system, then the answer is Yes, they can. It is legal to do so. The courts view the email system and its content as owned by the district or college. You can have a problem if inappropriate content is discovered in your emails or in your computer. For example, all too frequently school officials are finding pornographic pornography on a teacher's at school computer and I don't have to tell you that's going to be a problem. So, and here's the thing that you got to know, even if you're using private, like I have Gmail on my campus computers, that is still their computer. Now, you're lucky today, the computer I'm on today is my computer. But on campus, if I am sending uh, inappropriate stuff from my Gmail on my campus computer, uh, there still can be a problem. So just know that even if you're not on their email, if you're on their computer, you can have a problem. Okay, so here's all the things about social networking. And let me see here what we have about that. Uh, email correspondence, we talked about that. Uh, you get this, uh, number 17 and 18. You're going to get all these. Here, social networking risks and legal questions surrounding sexting and cheating with technology so you get those uh, here's the social network risk and if I were you 
uh, I would bring all these in so you have them. Once sent, always av uh, available to whoever. Uh, keep them separate. What's work related is, is not personal. Uh, and I had a little struggle with this when I first started because I didn't have anything email. There wasn't any available email other than campus. So I quickly was kind of using my campus email as everything and only to find that wasn't the right thing. So acknowledge you have sent is yours. Be careful. Could this embarrass you at some future time? That's a good question. Uh, does it add value? Will it improve the teaching and learning? Uh, this would be really careful. I had to learn this the hard way like most of us. Um, are we replying to a sender or to all? Because you may not want things to go to all. Uh, your personal website is not confidential. Uh, and we'll take, uh, wait, take another minute to review these tips before hitting the send key. Yes. Uh, there. So there's sexting. And you get to deal with this here. Um, and we'll look at that a little bit later. Misuse of social media by students. How about cheating? Another increasing challenge of teachers is determining what students use technology to cheat, of using a cell phone while taking a test to snap pictures to test items, having an outsider call in and correct answers, uh, plagiarism term papers and other problems. Fortunately, several websites and services check this. And I say to you is uh, really hard for me, especially uh, you know on, on the tests that I give you in this class. But if I ever suspect that you are, I'll prosecute you the fullest, which is, at the very least, you fail the course. Uh, if it's you're more than first offense, you're suspended from the program. Do your own work. Okay, and here's our question for the week. Should students be prosecuted as sex offenders for sexting? <coughs> and usual, I'm going to ask you not to respond until you've read the opinions of both of these folks. Okay, and so let me see if I can find this. Here it is. Should students be prosecuted for sex offense, sexing, uh, sex offenders for sexting? Students, not adults, students. Okay, that's what you get there. All right. So now we're done with you. And now the time's gotten long. I can do this. And it tells me that I'm a little over. We're going to uh, uh, keep going here. All right. And this is now about the students. And this is going to be a little faster uh, than it was. Um, and again, you get a couple big ones here. And just because I want you to be familiar, so we had 17, and this is 18, and you know the drill. I say, let me talk about them, then you write about them. Uh, have changed in the 60s. Um, Students' rights, uh, going further on behalf of students' rights. The biggest case ever was Tinkner uh, in 69. Uh, going further on behalf of students' rights, the federal court decided that principle of due process applied to students. These decisions led to several successful student challenges to school policies and procedures. However, and this is what how we write, we say however, after we've made a bold statement, since the late 80s, the court decisions have moved back toward increasing the authority of public school officials. Along the way, student life has become more complex, not only because of the such threats as increased use of drugs, the presence of weapons and gangs in schools, and because of diverse multicultural and shifting political contexts has made it diff more difficult to determine what is and what is not to do and say in school environments. So Tinkner said... Okay, let me see. Uh, key Supreme Court in '69 changed the balance by concluding that students do not shed their constitutional rights of freedom of speech and expression at the gate. Okay. So what it was, the little kids, uh, teenage kids, two brother, two from one family, one from another. Uh, they there was a big thing at the time of Vietnam War in the 60s, and they wore this. Uh, the, the thing that uh, was to rebel it, well, kind of like kneeling for the national anthem, was you wore this black armband. And they were warned from their school, 
if they, uh, in Des Moines, if they roar these armbands, they would be suspended. And here they come, and they claimed uh, that it was their their right, their freedom of expression. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, no, 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 it doesn't. You don't check your rights because you're a student. What it doesn't go on here to say is the court went on to say, unless it disrupts the school process. And so some of the authority of the school was safeguarded through that as it is today. Uh, so here's student rights things, 82 rights to education of eagle aliens. So this was was the beginning of you don't have to be documented to be entitled to a FAPE, a free appropriate public education. That was way back in 82, 75, Goss and Lopez, suspension of high school students without a hearing, ruled that in emergency, uh, in emergency can, a, a, can a student be suspended without a hearing, 75, Students can seek damages from individual school board members, but not the school. And that was huge. You could do that. Here's Tinkner. Court ruled against the school district, recognizing the extent to constitutional rights of pupils, I say, but they went on to say the school still has to have order. Um, board of Education uh, versus Pico. Court issued a decision that under certain circumstances, children may challenge the board decision to remove books. Ingham versus Wright court ruled that states may constitutionalize authorized corporal punishment. Okay, so, and what happened is, uh, through some of these court cases, they so limited the rights of schools, they no longer could govern their school properly, uh, especially in the light of drugs, gangs, weapons, stuff like that. Court ruled that states may constitutionally authorize corporal punishment. Here's one, Bethel versus Frazier. Uh, may discipline a student for making lewd and indecent speech in school assembly. And someday you'll get to read that. Uh, and that's, uh, I think I'll put that up and so get to see what that was about. Uh, Kuhlmeyer, Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer, school uh, administrator had broad authority uh, for student expression in a school newspaper. Honing versus Doe, 88. Uh, this is a sped one. Authorize officials to spend dangerous children for a maximum of a 10 days. Okay, think of that. So now you have to do something else. It doesn't say they have to come back to school. They can't be. Congress very much meant strip schools of illegal authority to exclude disturbed students. So school threatens, brings a weapon or whatever. You can suspend them up to 10 days. Then you have to provide them another uh, placement. They don't necessarily have to come back to school. <coughs> Jersey and TLO search and seizure must have reasonable cause when engaged in searches. Okay, and then students' uh, rights as citizens, uh, you get some of that. Uh, alien homeless children have right to go to school. Students' right to sue. Uh, students' right to due process. That's all right here. Um, in local parente, meaning in place of the parent. Uh, can you say that out loud in local parente? It's kind of a cool thing. So you may have to bring that out sometime, working with students, say, why is this? And you say, well, in local parente, because I'm in place of your parent here, and that will impress them and it may get you some get you somewhere. Okay. And then this procedural due process, you uh, talked about that. We looked at it earlier, due process. Here's procedural, substantive due process um, in that. And you get that, and then students' rights and responsibilities in school. Uh, let's see. Why did it jump back up here? <coughs> uh, that goes over here. And I am going to uh, let all that be. Where was this at? Oh, suspension, expulsion, and free speech. So you come up with that. And then these, uh, it does a great job of just ticking through these. This is 18. Uh, this is number 19. And you uh, show me you understand each of these with a one line. Um, So here, here's where they're at. Um, 
what's what the courts had to say about dress codes. Uh, and again, there's questions on the test. Hit these well because uh, not only it, this will matter to you, corporal punishment, uh, student rights uh, have adopted administrative rules and regulations to restrict the occasion of nature and manner of administering corporal punishment, uh, sex discrimination, uh, which is really gender, uh, Title IX, marriage and pregnancy, uh, Schools cannot prohibit a student from attending a school merely because they're married or have pregnant. Educators must report suspected child abuse and neglect. That one down there, I hope. Uh, yes, you have a, a responsibility for that. Uh, student publications, it talks a lot about that. Rights, students' disabilities, you know about. Um, students' locker and searches. Is it okay if the dog comes and uh, marks your locker as having drugs in it? <coughs> Beer sexual harassment has a lot of points about that. Rights of LBGT, cyberbullying, and these emerging challenges. Okay, so we have talked about the law in particular, your rights and responsibilities, student rights and responsibilities, and you now have two semesters of school law.